Welcome uh, to the Human Rights Happy Hour, um, comparing European and North American approaches to human rights, um, and specifically approaches to counterterrorism. Uh, so this is the first in a series of six talks, um, roughly every other week, not counting spring break, um, that most of you, I think, have seen the schedule for. Um, we've been very fortunate to put together the series um, with the help of European Studies and specifically a grant from the European Union. Um, and today, uh, the opening and the focus on counterterrorism, um, we're able to do also with the help of the Robert Strauss Center for International Security and Law. Um, this is an incredible turnout, um, and uh, you all discovered that it is a happy hour and the food was there to be eaten and the discussion to be had a little bit at the beginning, so good job on that. Um, you can do that every other week. Um, and um, the, uh, this is also a part of a seminar um, that I teach where we read papers by the speakers the week before they come. Um, and the students in the class, there are 14 of them, and they uh, have put up their, their name tags um, in part because they've written comments um, so that the speakers can respond to them and know who they are, and also they'll get a chance to ask the first few questions. Um, so today, uh, the focus is on, on counterterrorism. Just a little preview for next uh, two weeks from now. Um, it'll be on uh, European and US approaches to race, citizenship, and immigration. Um, and the speakers will be Liz Fekety from uh, the UK, uh, from Race and Class, and she has a paper called Europe Against the Roma. Um, and Letty Volp um, from Bolt Hall, uh, which is the law school at the University of California at Berkeley, um, who will be talking about the history of immigration and indigenous people in the United States. So we actually have two, uh, to begin with, the, 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 the US folks are, are doing a little bit of history, which is always good for us on the US side to hear. Um, and uh, anyway, you can stay tuned for, for what's coming up after that. Um, today, uh, to open, I'm very honored to introduce to you um, Aziz Rana and Fanola Nialoin. Um, and uh, I'll just say a, a very quick word about each of them. You have their um, bios, and I want you to hear from them. Um, so Aziz is a professor at Cornell Law School. Um, he's written a very important book called The Two Faces of American Freedom, um, and this is part of a, in some ways, a, a follow-up to that. Um, and his talk is Constitutional Na Nationalism and the Rise of the Security State, and he'll be taking us back to the late teens and early 20s in the U.S. and talking about some contemporary resonances of that as well. Um, Fanula is the Dorsey and Whitney Chair at the University of Minnesota and is also professor at the University of Ulster and founder and, and co-director of the Transna Transitional Justice Institute there. Um, she has written numerous books and articles, um, but two books that are relevant to her talk today. Um, one is entitled Exceptional Courts and Military Commissions um, and the other Law in Times of Crisis, both of which were written with Warren Gross. Um, and the talk that she'll be giving today is uh, entitled The Special Court as Risk and Opportunity, um, and that's a focus on the Diplock Courts in Northern Ireland. Um, I, the way that we thought we'd structure this is uh, they'll each stand and present for about 20 minutes, um, Aziz first, and then Fanula, um, and then we'll have a couple of discussion questions and get some of the reaction to the other one um, at the beginning, and then we'll open it up, and we have a lot of time, so um, it will go quickly, but uh, we should get to have a lot of good conversation um, between them and, and with you all. So please join me in welcoming Aziz and Fanula. Uh, so uh, I guess the, the first thing I'd like to just say thank you very much to, to Karen for inviting us here and uh, to Billy Chandler for doing all of the arrangements and making this possible. Um, and also uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to share I guess the day with Finola that I've gotten a chance to get to know Finola over the last couple of years and um, it's a really exciting opportunity for us both I think to, to be here and present work together. That was a, a big plus of, of, of coming. Um, so the material that was circulated 
is part of a book project that's currently in the initial stages that focuses on the entrenchment of what I'm currently tentatively calling constitutional nationalism. And by constitutional nationalism, I mean the idea that loyalty to the text of the Constitution, so attachment to the Constitution, is essential for American political identity. Um, as you hear from a number of different constitutional scholars, it's the Constitution and support for it literally constitutes us as a people. And what this particular uh, draft is attempting to grapple with is the extent to which a follow-up claim about the Constitution is actually his historically accurate. And that's the idea that one of the central things that support for the Constitution generates is a liberal political culture in the US. In other words, you have a number of different constitutional scholars that argue that, yes, the US has been marked by various problems when it comes to race relations, the sin of slavery most especially, but also issues around free speech rights, the suppression of dissent. But over the course of the 20th century especially, it's the culture of the Constitution, the kind of public climate that the Constitution respect for it creates that has moved the country steadily in increasingly liberal and inclusive dimensions. And you see this especially in the national security context. So a classic book in the last decade is Jeffrey Stone's Perilous Times, which I recommend that everybody read if you don't get a chance to read it. But one of the central arguments of Perilous Times is, OK, we've made mistakes at various moments in American history when it comes to civil liberties. But progressively, we're improving. The mistakes we're ma making are less bad, so to speak, than the previous mistakes that we engaged in. And a large part of this has to do with the culture of the Constitution that generates a degree of rights respect that constrains the power of the national security state. And you get this argument, for example, um, also in Richard Pildes, who I mentioned in the paper, where you know, the president, perhaps the president isn't constrained explicitly by courtroom decisions. The court has its own checkered history when it comes to rights protection. But it's the culture or climate of the Constitution that imposes particular kinds of political sanctions. The idea of acting in ways that, that are illegal or extra constitutional constrains uh, decision making at the highest level. So this is a, a common theme that the Constitution is a check on national security excess. And what the paper attempts to do is to problematize both the specific claim about national security and the broader argument about the relationship between constitutional support and a liberal public culture. In effect, what I'm trying to argue instead is that the kind of culture promoted by the Constitution mutually constitutes liberalism and illiberalism in the American experience. That it's not straightforwardly liberal, it's not straightforwardly illiberal, but these two things are bound together and neither is actually aberrational. And in a way, I want to do this by saying what matters about the Constitution is actually a lot less what constitutional scholars generally focus on. So most constitutional scholarship, except for Sandy Levinson here, whose work, uh, especially the book Constitutional Faith, is a central text for my own scholarship, a lot of what constitutional scholarship is about is doctrinal interpretation, court-based analysis. And I want to argue, by contrast, that the main thing the Constitution actually does, its primary political function, is shaping the ideological parameters of popular conversation and debate. Through a symbol, like the symbol of the Constitution creating a particular world in which <coughs> political disagreements take place. And I focus in sort of making this argument about the mutually constitutive nature of the illiberal and liberal dimensions of constitutionalism on what I take to be the national security origins of modern veneration for the Constitution, the unacknowledged national security origins in the World War I period and the years immediately following World War I. And in effect, what we see during this era is the way in which constitutional support as a mass public commitment emerged in tandem with the national security state. These two things constitute each other and produce sort of both greater veneration on the one hand and a more expansive security infrastructure. They created the climate, the conditions for today's, let's say, broad spread support of the Constitution that reaches from the Tea Party on the right to Occupy on the left. So to kind of work through this, I think I'll, I'll focus on three different elements of the paper and the project, kind of blending the two together. The first is, well, what was the prehistory like? Uh, what existed, let's say, in terms of the popular response or reception of the Constitution prior to the teens and 20s? 
The second, well, what was the specific elements of the way in which the wartime atmosphere fused constitutional support with pro-security measures? And then the third thing I'll talk a little bit about, well, what are the contemporary ramifications or significances of this particular history? So first, what was the, what was the late 19th, early 20th century environment like prior to World War I? Um, in a way, Americans have generally forgotten this period, which is a period of extensive popular disenchantment and disillusionment with the Constitution, both as a formal text, but also in terms of the kind of political atmosphere it generated and produced. So this is a period when you have widespread disillusionment. And in fact, let's say the late 19th, early 20th century might be a high tide of popular opposition or skepticism about the Constitution, but it's part of a broad general history. Essentially until more or less the 1970s, you always in American history had organized constituencies that were politically relevant, they might not have been majority positions, that straightforwardly challenged the first order legitimacy of the Constitution. This is something that's receded. We now have academic critics of the Constitution, but we don't have mass popular bases. So why is it that opposition reached a high tide in the late 19th, early 20th century? First was the fallout around the Civil War. So in 1887, there was a business-led effort to produce centennial <coughs> celebrations around the Constitution that fell more or less entirely flat. Very few people were willing to actually show up for these centennial celebrations, which might be a surprise. They couldn't find a keynote speaker. A number of people turned them down. <coughs> Nobody showed up in Philadelphia. And Yale Godkin, hardly a radical, argued in the nation. So Yale Godkin was a Republican and eventually kind of independent mugwump. Um, but the founder of the Nation magazine, he argued, well, there's a reason why people aren't showing up. The thing nobody wants to say is the Constitution failed. Its primary purpose was twofold. One, to establish a way to negotiate the relationship between state and federal government, and two, to figure out sectional divides, especially over slavery. And in both of these issues, it didn't actually live up to the promise, and if anything, the proof of the failure was a cataclysmic civil war, which at that time was one of, if not the, most violent war in human history. So 600,000 people died. And in this context of perceived failure, you had a number of different social groups with competing political ambitions that looked to the text, if not with suspicion, then certainly with disappointment. Radical Republicans who had been steeped in an abolitionist heritage still remembered folks like William Lloyd Garrison arguing that the Constitution was a compact withheld because it facilitated uh, Southern power and protected slavery. And certainly during Radical Reconstruction, Thaddeus Stevens supposedly referred to the Constitution as a worthless piece of parchment because in his view what it did is it allowed through divisions of power uh, a white Southern uh, uh, oligarchy to continue to maintain political authority and thwart projects of racial equality. Uh, and this had a lot to do with sort of the state's rights elements that were embedded in the Constitution, the Federalist principles that were still embedded. So you had radical Republican critiques. You had Southern sectionalists that were themselves opposed to the Constitution. They, they, their issues with the Constitution was that it was a symbol of, of defeat, of Confederate defeat. It was a national symbol. One of the things that happens in the post-war period is that African Americans for the first time start celebrating in mass July 4th. Previously, African Americans had celebrated July 5th as their Independence Day as a statement of dissent and opposition to the nature of American politics that allowed slavery to persist. But with Reconstruction, you have African Americans in the South coming out on July 4th while whites would stay home <coughs> as their own silent protest against the Declaration of Independence itself. And the Constitution was implicated with a project of Northern control that Southern politicians like, for example, Woodrow Wilson associated with the ways in which the Constitution and the amendments of the Reconstruction allowed the real, quote unquote, citizens of the South, white supremacists, to have their interests subordinated to an African American population um, that wasn't viewed <coughs> in terms of equality. At the same time, you also had African Americans who the experience of Reconstruction and quote unquote redemption was one of bondage to liberty back to bondage and in a sense might have maintained connection with an aspirational constitution but saw that as mixed with profound disappointment about the willingness of white society to actually fulfill its own principles. So the, the Civil War climate creates a condition of profound skepticism. And even more so than the Civil War climate, you have late 19th and early 20th century industrial conflict. 
This is the age of the industrialization of the US. And in particular, what it promotes is what's called, so let's say, a gilded culture. In other words, corporate power is ascendant and corporate power dominates the state. The institutions of the federal government are closely associated with business elites, and especially business elites from New York City specifically, a set of families that control some of the central elements of the economy, the industrial economy, especially railroads. And that the court becomes associated with especially the railroad industry. Um, the divided structure of the federal government is viewed as a mechanism for business to play on divided authority as a way of limiting popular efforts to transform the economy and pass social legislation. And for all of these reasons, the Constitution is viewed by populists, progressives, let alone socialists and those truly on the, the, the left, as an unwieldy instrument appropriate perhaps to the late 18th century, but inappropriate to modern conditions in the 20th. Now, how does this climate change? And the argument that I make is it starts to change. It doesn't change definitively really until the, the fallout of the 1960s, but it begins to change during World War I. And it begins to change in part because the mood around the Constitution shifts with a sense of impending war and crisis. You have a larger numbers of Americans, particularly Protestant whites, who see their own social status as slipping because of shifts in the economy, transformations in, uh, in immigration, ethnic composition, uh, consequences still of uh, black freedom and civil war as looking at the Constitution, perhaps it's flawed, perhaps it has its problems, but it was tied for them still to a particular kind of golden age. And it allows a business elite that had previously defined constitutional support. If you supported the Constitution in the years before World War I, you were what Norman Hopgood called a, pro uh, a, a professional patriot. Essentially, you could, you're a member of the ABA, you're a part of the business elite, you're a member of the Chambers of Commerce, but there's very little mass support outside of this business base. So it creates a mood or climate in which the sense of disorder promotes greater mass support. And at the same time, for pro-war groups in particular, who are calling for things like military preparedness during peacetime, so conscription during peacetime, the development of a standing army, a greater uh, surveillance framework in order to be able to suppress forms of, of potential dissent, these are arguments that many Americans have classically thought of as un-American. And these pro-war pro forces have to develop claims about why their own positions are consistent with American principles. And they focus on the Constitution as emblematic of a shared positive principle that justifies the expansion of a national security state. And in particular, by making a claim that the Constitution speaks to a particular exceptional history in the US. The Constitution is proof that the US is where the Enlightenment came down to Earth. And because it's where the Enlightenment came down to earth, it has to be preserved at all costs. And it also tells a story about a special role globally. With the US emergence out of the global stage, particularly following the Spanish-American War, there are real debates about whether or not the US should be an imperial quote unquote power. And the claim is that the Constitution is a safeguard against American power ever descending or devolving into imperialism. Because what the Constitution does is it ensures that American interests will always be compatible with the interests of those that face intervention since what the US promotes is a project of democratic self-rule and constitutional limitation rather than the unlimited power that's generally associated with imperialism. So it's a defense for war and a way of justifying preparedness on grounds of American value. And what you end up seeing is a number of civic organizations like the, the National Security League, the American Defense Society, the American Legion starting in 1919, develop both a mass base, so there are 100,000 members of the National Security League by 1916, but also spurring uh, projects of constitutional veneration. It's the National Security League that presses for the development of Constitution Day, which now is a national holiday, 1917. That's the first significant efforts to have something like Constitution Day. And along with moves for Constitution Day, educational events around the Constitution, there's also an emphasis on English-only uh, language laws as a way of instructing uh, presumably ethnically distinct people in like, the essence of Americanism and significant free speech infringements uh, and the criminalization of essentially various modes of dissent as part of a repressive apparatus to eliminate those that are deemed enemies of the state. And what this environment does is it creates a context in which constitutional support is bound to two key elements. 
The first is a mode of deferential citizenship, the very opposite let's say liberal defenders of the Constitution today associate with a constitutional culture. So the claim today is that what the Constitution promotes is a self-reflective, critically engaged citizenship that's able to, in, to participate in modes of dissent. For the folks in the teens and 20s, precisely because you have massive first order disagreement about the economy, about the state, what constitutional support is primarily about is creating ideological consensus through the text around the basic terms of government. And as a result, you have an emphasis on ideological uniformity when it comes to textual education. Uh, you have a call to think of the Constitution as bound to duties of citizenship, particularly military training and participation. And you also have a reverential culture around Constitution Day events and constitutional celebrations of the framers, the founders themselves, uh, embodied even in sort of like the great aesthetic products of the era. So, the Supreme Court that we see today is perhaps the dominant monument that was generated during this period. And it was designed by a man named Cass Gilbert, who himself had been part of the uh, Committee for Public Information during World War I, the propaganda wing, and was involved with the, Def the American Defense Society, the American Legion, and a big fan, actually, of Mussolini. So he went to Italy because he was enamored with neo-Roman architecture to get the stone from Siena, the marble, to build the building. He was excited about uh, his design. He sent pictures of it to Mussolini, who he met in person. And his central idea was that the, the monument should embody the kind of authority that citizens should experience in relationship to their text. And then the second element of this is the way in which arguments about exceptionalism bound to claims of cultural particularity. On the one hand, to claim that the Constitution is the central element of American identity is to make a universal claim about what it means to be American, believing in a certain set of ideas. But many Europeans had Enlightenment commitments. Socialists had Enlightenment commitments. How do you justify the particular institutions of the state? And here the thought was that Americans had a specific cultural heritage that went back all the way to the Puritan period in which they alone were able to develop the kind of connections to a specific text that generated a liberal culture. And as a result, this meant protecting against foreign influences and threats. And it also meant claiming a project of tutelage, both abroad and at home, that differentiated between insiders and outsiders. So in this way, exceptionalism bound together universal claims with assertions of cultural superiority. So what's the relevance for the present? And this is basically where I'll stop. To me, what I think it speaks to is not just that this is sort of like the dark or troubled origins of a modern culture uh, of constitutional veneration, but also the lasting implications of how constitutional veneration was forged in the US and the meaning of the Constitution as a symbolic text specifically for American life. First, one of the reasons why constitutional scholars, let's say like Tribe or Sunstein or others, are able to talk or stone about the self-reflective dimensions of a constitutional climate is precisely because dissent has been pacified. A hundred years ago, there were fundamental alternatives that were on the table that were not just tied to the formal text, but the formal text or claims that we should have a parliamentary system were bound to fundamental changes in the economy. And in a way, the story of the development of constitutional support is a story of eliminating those alternatives. And so it's very different to have a culture of dissent against a background of shared unanimity than one when there's actual fundamental fissures about basic questions of state and politics. And so there's a constitutive relationship in this way. We can be liberal today because of a, an originary or, uh, or, or founding position of profound illiberalism. The second is the arguments about exceptionalism have facilitated some of the most important reform movements a focus on greater civil liberties protections at home, the civil rights movement, as two just profound examples. But they've also sustained a logic of interne interventionism abroad that has the necessary effect of expanding the security framework that defines American politics. And these things can't necessarily be disconnected. In a way, this is the flip side or the dark side of what Mary Dudziak writes about when she talks about Cold War civil rights, that it's precisely the exceptionalist politics that justifies creedal arguments about reform, but also justifies a security infrastructure that expands the footprint of the state, 
And those two things are bound. And finally, <coughs> this connects to my first book, is that you know, my view is that most of American history can be understood as a particular experiment in settler colonialism. The US story is not that different than South Africa, than Algeria, than Australia. And that it was marked by differentiating between the rights provided settler insiders and a variety of external groups that faced different forms of control depending on whether or not land was being expropriated or excluded communities were being um, employed to engage in uh, uh, unfree or menial forms of work. And as a result, one of the things that this story of constitutional support and veneration does is it fundamentally retells the experience of the American past. In other words, what the logic of American constitutional nationalism uh, produces or promotes is the idea that from the very founding, the US has been a liberal equal society. And what's been aberrational has been things like slavery or the stuff that we associate with repression and liberalism. And instead, we're engaged in a kind of progressive track of fulfilling what was always the basic principles of the country. And this, I think, does a disservice both to historical memory, but it also transforms the country into a kind of post-colonial state without ever actually going through the hard work of colonial rupture, transforming the basic framework and institutions that justified modes of authority that continue to be present in various ways today without ever being acknowledged or discussed. So I'll stop there. So my thanks also to, um, to Karen for bringing us here um, and Billy for ensuring our smooth arrival. And it is always a pleasure um, to be in the same forum as Aziz. So um, this is a, a welcome conversation. So I, I'm going to talk about something very different. I'm focusing uh, in particular on the use of exceptional courts. Um, and uh, the presentation is based on a long-standing uh, empirical body of work that my colleague in Belfast, uh, Colin Campbell, and I have been undertaking. Uh, let me start, before I discuss the empirical work itself and the specific legal context in Northern Ireland, I want to say something, a couple of general framing uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the conflict to say a couple of things about it. Um, as some of you or many of you may know, uh, Northern Ireland's conflict, the last round of which started in the late 1960s, uh, is long standing. Um, it is a conflict involving both state and non-state actors. Uh, it was a conflict involving civilian targeting. It was a conflict involved, involving the sustained use of military forces on the ter territory of a democratic state. Um, and at the center of that conflict is a democratic state using law to manage violent challengers. Now we, the language we'll use about those violent challengers, whether we call them terrorists or non-state actors or the, the currency in Northern Ireland was paramilitary actors, um, is, is a whole separate conversation. But um, what's interesting about this case is that it presents the paradox of a democratic state struggling with violent offenders. And in the context of that, you see a democratic straight state struggling with the, the management uh, consequences that follow from using law and legal means to manage violent offenders. Um, and so, except for many measures, of course, uh, figured in the state's management of conflict. They include things that seem new in the American context but have been with us in, in Northern Ireland, the United Kingdom, for decades, targeted killings, the use of informers and other kinds of individuals to give uh, uh, information to the state, the wholesale surveillance of communities, uh, the use of different kinds of technologies as they existed and evolved over a 30-year period to gather information on communities, uh, and the interface of both civilian actors like the police with military actors uh, in the management of, of those challenges. Now, of course, what's unusual for the democratic state is the democratic state, when it engages in the use of law as a counter as a management tool for conflict, a number of obvious paradoxes arise for the democratic state. One is, of course, uh, the challenge of how you define the conflict itself. Because in some sense, uh, particularly if you're going to, you know, at various points in this conflict, there was a question as to whether or not 
the conflict met the threshold of armed conflict under the Geneva Convention? Was this an armed conflict sufficient to activate the law of armed conflict? And um, those kinds of questions pose really existential questions for the democratic state, because of course even the recognition of the status of conflict itself uh, is fundamental to the sort of uh, the trigger issues that produce the conflict in the first place. And in that context, going back to the idea that for the liberal democratic state, there is a sort of an optimal limit, and we can talk about this in the Q&A, in the use of force that can be exercised to address the actions of non-state violent actors, then law and legal process become central to the management of armed conflict. And so in that context, the legal order of the United Kingdom was the key management tool uh, 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 for the conflict. And the courts were central to that enterprise. Um, the British courts, therefore, and the ordinary law of the United Kingdom, which was the presumed sort of framework under which conflict management occurred, uh, in theory, applied throughout the conflict to Northern Ireland. Um, the police force, um, the what was then called the RUC, was a predominantly Protestant, so the community is divided into Protestants and Catholics, uh, was a predominantly Protestant force uh, managing a uh, 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 the exercise of, of force against a predominantly Catholic or minority community. Um, and pretty soon after the conflict emerged in the late 1960s, the military was deeply involved in the de arrest and detention uh, they were essentially deployed in aid of the civilian power. So you have this confluence of actors and context, all again functioning within apparently a, a functional democracy. Now, as we all know, so that with that as background, as we all know, legal analysis of the war on terror post 9-11 has been a growth industry in the United Kingdom and the United States. But what's interesting for an observer like myself is that much of this is not so new. In fact, much of this we've sort of seen uh, over and over again. And as many of you will be, be aware, a substantial literature has emerged around the kind of legal responses to terrorism post 9-11. Two key features of that literature is one is the idea that states, and scholars have used this term, including myself, a business as usual counterterrorism model. The idea that one promotes or relies on existing uh, legal uh, sources and mechanisms to, to address and to manage the violence or the challenge that the state um, is, is facing. That model assumes the sufficiency of the ordinary law to cope. Right? At the other end of the spectrum, what we find is a separate set of assumptions, an exceptional powers uh, model, which assumes that, in fact, the ordinary law is insufficient, that the ordinary law can't cope, and therefore that the state will have to either explicitly or implicitly uh, adopt uh, exceptional powers or rules to address the violent challenges it faces. And mostly these are depicted as a kind of a, a pendulum where you swing from one to the other and that the line goes one way, meaning that even if you start off in a business as usual model, you're eventually going to end up somewhere in the exceptional powers regime because it's almost impossible to manage without it. Um, and there's also, of course, in this space, this, this assumption that you have either exceptional powers or ordinary powers, a another set of discussions that talks about a sort of a zone of lawlessness when we, um, when we address or when states uh, address violent offenders. Uh, and that, that zone of lawlessness for state actors exists outside of both of these sort of conceptions, ordinary law or exceptional law. And so this paper that some of you have read is, uh, is an attempt to address that antinomy by looking at data from exceptional courts. And let me explain what we were trying to do in our data collection and how we, um, how we use some of the, this information that we've gather, gathered on the functional of exceptional courts to sort of undo some of these presumptions about one or the other or a one-way traffic from one to the other. And so, unusually, perhaps because it is a democracy, Northern Ireland is one of the few places where we have a complete data set on the use of exceptional courts from about 1970 uh, four onwards. Um, and so the parameters of this study, which was conducted in the post-peace, there was a peace treaty in Northern Ireland in 1998, 
Essentially, the data I'm going to talk about today is data that was collected after 1998, but syncs with this earlier sort of three decades of data collection on the use of courts. So what's unusual is that put together, this data set gives you a 30-year longitudinal look at how the state has used exceptional courts and what it tells us about norm and exceptions, particularly uh, in the use of, of, court, uh, of courts and of trials. Um, it, so it's got a longitudinal dimension. The case, we looked at about, for this study, about 400 individual cases of persons tried under national security specific provisions in the United Kingdom uh, between 1998 and, and 2001. So, but the subset we're going to talk about today is 2000 to 2001. And so we had a couple of key questions in the, in, as we went through court files. One was who's being interrogated. Who, who, are you, who are you picking up? The second is, do they have lawyers present? How extensive were the interrogations? Uh, do they make confessions? And if so, when do they make confessions? And do the lawyers make any difference? Or does the length of time that they're held make any difference? Now, as you know, these are all not, um, these are not abstract questions. Because in the course of policy conversations, obviously, extremely relevant to the United States, but also of ongoing relevance to the United Kingdom post uh, uh, the events in London of 2005, there are two ongoing arguments. One is, do you let the lawyers in? And second of all, that we should hold people for, for longer periods of time, because we need to hold them in order to get to, to have successful interrogations that give us information sufficient to try and process individuals. Um, so those are the micro questions. And the reason why those micro questions we think are useful is because they allow us to open up onto another set of bigger questions. One of those big questions is this sort of norm exception dynamic. And um, the second for us is a set of questions about hybridization, meaning that part of what we were looking at is whether you get convergence between ordinary systems of law and exceptional system of laws, exceptional systems of law when you have long-term use of court and other processes uh, to process um, violent challenges, challenges. And we were also interested in figuring out whether over time, the liberal democratic order, whether it in fact exercises a dampening role on the court's exceptional use of certain kinds of powers, and what kinds of effects on legal culture uh, we see as a result of the states, of the contestation that happens within the courtroom. Because remember, once you start to process these cases, the courtroom itself and the exceptional court becomes not only a ritual space where all kinds of arguments are made around a con contesting both the conflict itself and the state's management of the conflict, but it also becomes a space in which there's exposure for the state. So let's just focus a little bit on the exposure before I talk about the data. The exposure for us is that often in exceptional trials, you get a confluence of the what we call the open state and the closed state. And the open state is, in a sense, fairly obvious. But the, but the closed or secret state is deeply involved in the production of the processes that generally bring violent offenders to trial. They can include um, the, the, the arrest process, um, surveillance, uh, informers, the use of collusion or other kinds of devices to get information, um, the interrogation of the suspect, um, and the kind of evidence that flows from the intelligence, source of intelligence bodies of the state into the court. So the courtroom itself doesn't just tell you something about the nature of the conflict or the interface between the non-state actors and the state, but it's also revealing certain things about the state itself. And that's why this the, the, the exceptional court is a very unusual space to sort of track what the democratic state is doing. And part of the thing is we don't often know, I mean, the example I give in the paper is, generally speaking, you're not in the interrogation room, right? You know, there are no witnesses to waterboarding unless you destroy the evidence. But generally speaking, we don't have access. But the, co but the exceptional trial, the, the, the terrorism trial, offers us a window into the state's behavior in a way that's, that's particularly unusual. So let me just say a little bit about what the data on these 400 cases reveals 
And for those who've read the paper, they will have seen it in, in more detail. So one of the things we saw is that, in fact, defendants are older, significantly older, in fact. Um, the age of the ma majority of defendants is falling into the 28 plus age range. Now that's actually very interesting because much of the profiling and the information we have about radicalization and mobilization tends to suggest and focus on a much younger group of individuals. So there's uh, significant findings about the profile of the individual engaged in violent contestation with the state and the kind of radicalization or mobilization that that particular group uh, has experienced, which we think falls outside of much of the sort of sort of mainstream literature on who's likely to be most rad radicalized and where uh, efforts around uh, identifying radicalization should look. And the other thing, the second thing that the data reveals for us is about um, arrest. And, and again, just recall that this is a 30-year conflict in which at the early part of the conflict, the primary actors involved in arrest and detention are military actors. They're the, they're the, they're the British Army, effectively, uh, showing up outside your door, usually at about 4 a.m. was the, the time of choice, 4 to 5 a.m. in the morning. And what, we know, what the data tracks in these 400 cases over time, because the, the, the files tell you when people are picked up and brought into detention, is that in fact, over time, we see a move from the use of military forces to the regular police. Now, there are lots of things one could say about that. One is that that tracks a move to normalization, and it tracks a move of the cost for the liberal democratic state to use exceptional military force in routine policing over a long period of time. There are exceptionally high legitimacy costs for the state in doing so. And, but what, it doesn't, what the data doesn't also reveal, which separate work that we've been engaged in has told us a little bit about, is the increased militarization of the, quote, normal police force by constant engagement and interaction with working side by side with the military. So, the move is, on one sense, a move that, that speaks to a normalization move, but in fact needs to be contextualized by ongoing engagement between these two sort of state actors in this setting. And um, the third thing we, we see in the data is that even over the 30-year period, that it is increasing, it remains consistently difficult to get access to lawyers. So access to lawyers are denied consistently over the period. By the end, in the data set we're looking at, under the ordinary pace, sort of regular criminal law of the United Kingdom, 87% of those arrested are getting access to a lawyer. Only 4% under the PTA, the Prevention of Terrorism Act, are getting access to a lawyer. Why is this important? Well, what's interesting is that the data is showing us that in fact it makes little difference to confessions whether a lawyer is present or not. And I can talk a little bit more about that finding in the Q&A. But if that is the case, given the amount of resistance, state resistance we've seen to accessing lawyers into the interrogation space, it's not clear on this data set, in fact, that the costs are as high to the state as they appear to be. I think that's an interesting finding. Um, the other really interesting findings we have is on confessional evidence. So in the early part of the conflict, when we compare our data with the sort of 28 years of data before, through most of the conflict, the emphasis was on producing confessional evidence. Much of the evidence that was produced in these courts was confessional. It didn't help that the IRA blew up the one forensic lab that we had in Belfast sometime around the mid-1980s, so that, that was problematic or strategic, depending where you're sitting. Um, but, it, but it was very clear that, there was a, that the reliance on confessional evidence was extremely high throughout the early part of the conflict. That shifts over time, and by the end of the conflict, we're seeing a, 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 a situation in 2001, 2002, where only 25% of the cases are reliant on confessional evidence to produce a conviction. Why is that important? I, again, we can talk about it in the Q&A, but one of the things we see here is the, the external pressures on the state um, were growing in the 20-year period leading up to these changes. One of the challenges of confessional evidence is that it came with allegations of torture, ill-treatment, uh, and coercion of detainees, including, as many of you may recall, a series of cases before the European Court of Human Rights. The result of that being 
that it's very clear that there's a move here for the state, whether both from international legal <coughs> sources, but also from the challenge of legitimacy internally to, to, see, to, to move or shift its reliance on confessional evidence. And finally, another, uh, just uh, in terms of that, the last piece of interesting data that I, I, I just want to articulate is the length of time to confession. So one of the things that um, has been a long-running discussion in the United Kingdom and, and also here is how long can you hold a person and interrogate that person and the attempts to uh, extend detention time. So there's been a long series of debates in the UK about extending detention, peri detention periods for persons uh, uh, who are believed to have engaged in terrorist acts. And um, what our data set finds is that, in fact, 75% of oral confessions are made in the first 48 hours of, of these are all terror, of terrorist detainees, are made within the first 48 hours of their detention. That's a very, obviously, pretty interesting finding because what it suggests is that the state's claim to holding individuals past that 48-hour uh, period doesn't hold in terms of the classic arguments that you're not getting the kind of evidence you need in order to prosecute them for crime. So a separate set of questions is why you hold them. And in other work that uh, we have done and that I have done, we've looked at the use of that extended period of time for intelligence gathering purposes. Our view is it's, there's actually very functional reasons why that time extension is being sought. It has nothing to do with conviction. It has a lot to do with evidence gathering. Okay, um, so let me just, so, so that's some of the interesting, I think, um, uh, interesting outcomes of the, of the study. Um, what, what I think, there's a couple of sort of general comments that I want to close on about what we, what, what the data tells us and, and what's important. Well, one is the obvious fact that there's a dearth of data on um, both detention practices and on exceptional courts. So, and, and we've seen the book I've just finished is a, is a survey of um, uh, exceptional courts in multiple countries across the, the, the resort to exceptional courts by democracies is not new. So whether we're talking about India or Israel or Northern Ireland, exceptional courts are, are, are a pretty, uh, are, are, a one, are a place where democratic states regularly stop. Um, but we know very little about them. So one of the things that I think that's important in what this study, this, this, this data collection speaks to is the need for sustained and consistent data collection uh, in sites where you can gather the data so that you know something about the, the dynamics and the functionality of the processes that are being used. The second thing I think that comes out of the study and that we explore is this idea of the sort of the juridification of these courts over time. So it's very clear that these become less exceptional over the period of a 30 year conflict. And that less exceptional has both positive and negative dimensions, right? They become less exceptional in the sense that the sort of the presence of law and the regulatory scope over various actors within the court apparatus and in the detention apparatus is more firmly articulated. But correspondingly, of course, what that means is sort of this notion of the sort of normalization, normalization doesn't quite happen. And the place where we see that most cogently in the United Kingdom is in the deprival of the right to silence, what we would call Miranda rights here, first removed for terrorist offences in Northern Ireland in 1987, and then extended to the rest of the UK for what we would call ordinary decent criminals in Belfast. Um, so, um, and um, I think the third thing I'd like to say is just that um, I think it opens up a set of interesting questions, again, about the paradoxes um, and this, I think, connects significantly with Aziz's sort of thinking on the paradoxes for the democratic state. Because by self-definition, the definition, the sort of legitimacy quotient of the democratic state ought to make irrelevant any questions of abuse or denial of rights or that there are a set of ways in which when faced with violent challengers, the democratic state finds itself in highly complex, paradoxical sort of, sort of corners. And the result of that is that when the state takes legal shortcuts, what some of our data suggests is that, don't, that those shortcuts eventually catch up with those states in some ways that can be predicted and some ways not. Now, the catching up shouldn't always be presumed to be a liberal move, meaning that 
even as we take these spaces that seem outside of law, where the democratic state moves sort of to this zone of anomie or, or grayness, and the ordering and legitimizing of that state can end up in itself being illiberal. And so we shouldn't assume that the move to normalization is in itself a liberal move for the democratic 